Thank you. I want to talk this evening about, I think, the thing that is probably most important in my life. And I think it's probably most important in your lives as well. And I hope by the end of this session that you will see that there are ways in which you can be part of my vision and that my vision can be part of your lives. My vision is about how we think global when we act local. We've talked about it for years. It's a concept that started very clearly in the 1970s. And I've put it above a picture of the world. Not just any picture of the world. That particular picture is actually a computer. It has traveled through science museums across the world. And on that computer, scientists can register data about the way the world is behaving. I've seen data on that that shows what happens in floods. I've seen data that happens on that that shows what happens with tsunamis. I've seen data on that that shows what happens with illness, the spread of AIDS, the spread of Ebola, what happens if you're taking any major environmental disaster to trees or anything else? And what was quite clear to me the first time I saw that was that this planet of ours, when you see it as a single global ecosystem, this single planet of ours, it does not recognize territories or countries. It operates as an ecosystem. And for the first time in the history of this planet, one species is damaging it, potentially beyond repair. And that species is us. We hold responsibility for this damage. We hold responsibility for potentially ruining the lives of future generations. And the oddity is that so many people care about this planet of ours. If we were uh, out on the Gower, the first area of national beauty, sorry, of outstanding natural beauty in the UK, people would be celebrating the sunset, celebrating the sea, celebrating the scenery. And yet they might go back and take holidays, short-haul flights, and carry on emitting in ways that are now damaging the planet, hopefully not irreparably. Now, I have wondered why this matters to me so much. And it struck me the other day when I met a BBC reporter who last interviewed me six years old, uh, six years ago, when I was in the National Assembly for Wales, and had interviewed me quite regularly about what I'd done as education minister, what I'd done as environment minister. And when I was telling him what I was now doing in the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, here in Swansea and Carmarthen in Lampeter, across the whole region, focusing our curriculum and our offer around sustainability, preparing our students for the challenging times ahead, creating creative problem solvers, new kinds of skills, he said, you've reinvented yourself well. I'm not sure it was a compliment. But when I thought about it, I thought I actually haven't reinvented myself at all. I have just had that set of beliefs all my life. But it wasn't until I was 35 that I actually realized what really mattered to me. And I think partly, what we do in those very early years of our lives, we need to think about the influence. Because Aristotle said, give me the child of seven, and I will give you the man. And it is so true, because so much of our value systems, so much of the way we relate to the world, so much of whether we're curious or not in the context of education, comes about in those very early years. And I was brought up in Africa. Uh, in what is now Zimbabwe, 
but was then Rhodesia. My father was there to start what was then the first multiracial medical school in Africa. My mother was a doctor in the bush, and many a time I sat under baobab trees while waiting for her to see a long line of women. But I learnt three really essential things while I lived in Africa. One was about racial inequality. How can it be fair that people are discriminated against because of the colour of their skin? Yet I was living there under a man called Ian Smith, who had seized power as a white man. And as a white girl, I could go anywhere. My black counterparts were moved out of houses in the district I lived in under that leadership. We didn't have apartheid as a law as in South Africa. We had it as a policy. So I learned a fundamental lesson about the importance of equality. I learned a fundamental lesson as well about the importance of education. I was in a school. We did spend a lot of our time outside. I learned so much outside. But I had a book on my desk. And every time I had a new lesson, I had another book. I wasn't sharing one book in that picture between three, but I have been in schools in Africa where children are sharing one book among a hundred. It is not appropriate in this world that we still have girls and boys, but particularly girls, who do not get education. It is wrong. It is absolutely unequal. We should be doing more about it. But it also taught me about waste. It taught me that nobody wastes anything. Every resource is used and reused. And since I grew up under sanctions, we didn't change furniture. I turned up in boarding school in the early 1970s in the UK with one frock and was shocked by the consumerism that I experienced here. Absolutely shocked. And that shock has never left me. The second major epiphany for me is when we did come and live in Wales. We came to Cardiff when the new University Hospital of Wales opened, and my, both my parents went, worked there as doctors. And I was at boarding school and hadn't seen them for a very long time because I didn't even get letters from what was then Rhodesia under sanctions. When I finished my O-levels, I had nearly been expelled on eight occasions, and my only crime was to break out of school to climb hills. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything else. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't bullying. I was just trying to get outdoors, because it was the fundamental thing that me means I have my happiness in my life. There's nothing better for me, probably, than standing in the middle of a peat bog in the pouring rain and smelling the peat where nobody else is in sight and having that experience, that epiphany with, with nature. But I had a real epiphany because we went and walked the Pembrokeshire Coast Path, four girls, ages 15 to 16, after our O-levels, on our own, but the YHA then, you could go the whole of the Pembrokeshire Coast Path by youth hostel, and every night, you rang your parents, and the warden oversaw you doing it to tell them that you were all right. So the warden checked from day to day who came in, and it really was a way in which young people could get out safely, and they could play safely. We swam every day in the sea. Nobody watched us. We swam with seals. Occasionally, we swam with porpoises. Occasionally, we leapt out of the way of, uh, of, of particular jellyfish. But I remember one day at a place called Pulkderi, and some of you, I hope, will know it, just off Strumble Head, waking up in the morning and looking down over this incredible pool, uh, which was in front of the hostel, and in the middle was a Portuguese man of war. And the colours were so extraordinary of that day, and that day is etched in my mind. So I discovered walking, and I've walked most of the long distance um, footpaths in the UK, and many of you will know it had effects on what I did subsequently. But this is when I was 35. This was the biggest epiphany in my life. Because I didn't know that I was an environmentalist. I didn't know that I was passionate about poverty until I found out that I was a gender 21 woman. <laughs> 
And that'll mean nothing to most of you in the audience. And the Rio Declaration is huge. Multi-country documents always are huge. But the point about the Rio Declaration is for the first time, it made absolutely clear that human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. They're not entitled to rip up the world for their own benefit, for their own profit motive. They are entitled, we are all entitled, as part of one species, to live in harmony with nature. And therefore, from then, I probably have spent every job that I've done, and that's quite a range, doing everything I can in my small way to contribute towards the idea of a one-planet life. Whether it's, as this book describes, the opportunity that's only here in Wales that I was able to legislate for, where young people, because that was the focus for me, was on young people, could build homes in the countryside, affordable homes, if they were prepared to live low-carbon lives. And this book tells you exactly how to do it and to get your management plan in place. But it wasn't just about that. If we go back to that, those points about Africa, what I was able to do subsequently then is put education for sustainable development and global citizenship into the Welsh curriculum. What I was able to do is introduce a baccalaureate with the idea of the breadth of learning that would enable Wales to have a wider reach in the whole world. What I was able to do in the environment in government was introduce the Wales Coast Path, was put sustainability at the heart of government, and also to introduce the legislation that has now made Wales, I'm told, third best in the world, sorry, second best in Europe, and third best in the world in the context of recycling, and of course, take plastic bags out of the system. Now, those pieces of legislation, all together, are factors of my upbringing, just as things you believe are factors of your upbringing. And there was a critical moment when I was given the environment portfolio back at the beginning of 2007, when we as a family decided that we were going to be greener every year than we'd been the year before. We've kept to that. And that has been critically important as a way of both of demonstrating that you do get a better quality of life living that way. Because after all, all those things that really matter they're not whether you have the newest car or the newest phone. You'd throw those away tomorrow if anybody you loved was ill. When I went back and looked at that picture of the world right at the beginning, if the world had been a member of our family, we'd kutch it. We wouldn't break it. And yet we treat this world of ours, because it's so much bigger than any of us individually, as something that we can break that we can trash, that we can carry on not considering in our daily actions. So for me, I am always going to try and live a one-planet life, and I hope that others will come on that journey. But one of the things I discovered about Rio was that you can create those declarations. Countries can sign up, just as they signed up to the Millennium Development Goals, just as they've now all signed up, to the sustainable development goals that we have. Very exciting, 17 goals, which actually will dramatically change what goes on in the world. Um, if the countries, over 190 countries signed up to that, deliver on big ambitions around quality education, around climate change in this age of the Anthropocene, about land, about water, about fairness, equality, about collaborating together, about working across boundaries. We had a climate agreement in Paris. I've been to three of those major climate conferences. And each time, particularly in Copenhagen in 2009, we thought we were going to get it. We thought we were going to get those world agreements. But they slipped away. And the greater the scientific challenge is, the more it slips away the more the normal political processes find it difficult to engage with this agenda. So I think you do have to do things yourself. You have to make the individual and the political the same. You have to do it in your home. You have to do it in your workplace. You have to do it in your country. 
because you can also then encourage others. Wales is a beacon for many other countries at the moment because the bomb I left government in the manifesto was for Wales to legislatively commit itself to introduce sustainability into everything that the Welsh government did. That is now the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. You may not know about it, many of you, yet. It's only a year or so old. And people are only starting to assess where they are now. But that act will change the lives of people in Wales because that defines prosperity as low carbon. That de defines work as decent work. That has requirements on people to consider how they can contribute to physical and mental health how they can contribute towards equality, to cohesive communities, to culture and language, and to make sure, picking up on that Brundtland definition of health and wealth, that no future generation is in a worse state than the one we're in now. Now, we know that 60% of species were made extinct between 1970 and 2012. And we know that the predictions for the future are as bad, if not worse, if we don't take action. So in my own little way, you're looking at my lifestyle. You're looking at what we grow in our garden, what we forage for, how we get our energy. And there are actually two pictures that are linked to cider. <laughs> because after all, you've got to have some fun <laughs> as well. But I think the message that I was once given about live your passion has stayed with me all my life. My passion is to do what I can to work with others at home, in the village I live in, through the university, in the country, and more widely, on looking at how we can be stewards of our planet, how we can deliver better opportunities for future generations. After all, as John Rawls said, do unto future generations what you would have past generations do unto you. And just to close, Satish Kumar, a man who walked 8,000 miles with no money for peace in the 1960s, I interviewed on his whole life a couple of years ago. And he said profoundly, ecos is the Greek for the planet home. Ecology is the knowledge of the planet home. Economy is the management of the planet home. How can we be in a situation where we only care about the economy, the management of the planet home, without any knowledge of it? No wonder we're in a mess, and it's time to bring ecology and economy together to really look after this single planet of ours, and also, selfishly, to look after our own species. Thank you.